it's an honor for me to introduce our speaker, but um, given your introduction, Gordy, I need to say that uh, the lectureship was endowed not by me, uh, <laughs> but by friends of the seminary who, when I left the dean's office, uh, thought that would be uh, a nice uh, reminder of uh, ministry here, and I'm grateful for that. I'm also grateful that it's not the Swetland Memorial Lectureship. <laughs> It is a delight to welcome the Reverend Dr. Pete James to the uh, podium today and tomorrow. Uh, Pete is a graduate of Gordon-Conwell. He has served his entire pastoral ministry at one church, the Vienna Presbyterian Church in Virginia, a church that was founded by nine original members in 1781, 91. Uh, today it has 2,600 members and an attendance of over 3,000. Uh, Pete went there after he graduated from here in 1979, and he was associate pastor at that time, and then became the uh, co-pastor in 1984 and the senior pastor in 1986. It's remarkable when you think about that. We're honored to have people like Pete uh, among our graduates here. Uh, Pete also got his Doctor of Ministry from Union Seminary in Virginia in the early 90s. But to think of somebody who has served in one church for 34 years is remarkable. Last time I saw a survey of the average tenure of a pastor in America was just a few years ago, and at that time, the average tenure was only four years. And to have someone be in a church for 34 years is remarkable. Uh, Pete and his wife, Chris, are good friends. Uh, actually, back in the late 70s, his wife, Chris, worked for me when I was overseeing public relations at the school, and she was a gifted artist, and back in those days, we did things the old-fashioned way. Everything was done by hand, not on computer, and uh, Chris was a very fine uh, worker at the time. We also know, of course, uh, uh, Pete and Chris are the parents of uh, Andrew uh, James, who's a student here. Uh, they also uh, have a daughter uh, named Emily, who is married and lives in Pennsylvania. And I suspect that the attraction for Pete and Chris to come to our campus so regularly this year is not just to see son Andrew, but to see the grandkids, Luke and Wesley. And I just have to say, Pete, that you don't look old enough to be a grandpa. <laughs> but come and minister the word to us. Welcome. It is great to be with you. All right. Great to be with you. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, think with you today about uh, a wider lens of a culture in which we live and minister. A and then tomorrow, when I'm with you, I'll think more about being in one place so long and some of the observations I'll make with that. I'd like to read uh, from Matthew's Gospel these words, Matthew chapter 16 and the first four verses of Matthew 16. The Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, when evening comes, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red, and in the morning, today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and went away. As we uh, begin with prayer, uh, today's prayer, Psalm 19, seems so appropriate. Let's join together in prayer. O Lord, your law is perfect. 
reviving the soul. Your statutes are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Your precepts are right, giving joy to the heart. Your commands are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Your fear is pure, enduring forever. Your ordinances are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, yea, much more than pure gold. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As Ken mentioned, I came to Gordon-Conwell in 1976, which was seven years after the seminary came together, Conwell School of Theology and Gordon Seminary. And outside of evangelical circles, uh, this new seminary was relatively not very well known. In fact, uh, many people would say they'd butcher the name do they, they still do that? Uh, that um, I go to Gordon Cromwell or things worse. And uh, we bought these, these grounds, uh, an old Carmelite high school for boys preparing for the ministry. And since it was only seven years removed from that, the architecture of the Catholic Church, particularly the altar, was very present on campus. Harold John Ockengay was a president in those days, the seminary's first president. And my memory of him is gliding down the hall in his three-piece suits, which he wore every day. And uh, he was resolute about the mission of the school, albeit somewhat removed from the students. Uh, Ken Swetland had come to uh, join the administration, and, and Doug Stewart and Ray Pendleton were professors here. Have they always been here? I don't know. <laughs> and, and there were new professors uh, that were coming, uh, Dean Borgman and uh, John Jefferson Davis and uh, Garth Roselle and later David Wells. Gerald Ford was a president in 1976, and his son, Mike, was a student here. So uh, you always knew where Mike was on campus because uh, the two secret servicemen were always outside the library or the auditorium. What I remember in those days was that the church still enjoyed home field advantage. Less so in New England, but vast regions of the United States were still uh, very much Christian. A and I would make a statement that I know is overgeneralizing things, but it seemed as if the Judeo-Christian ethic was embraced by everybody, or so it seemed. And there has been a seismic shift that have taken place, and maybe I recognize it because I've been in one place so long, and I've watched it morph, the culture. And I didn't know the word postmodern when I was in seminary, but clearly it was exerting an enormous influence on our culture. Now, I could use for you any number of examples about the shift in culture. But let me pick one, a controversial one, that of couples living together before marriage. Now, I don't want to go on my moral high horse here. I just want to cite for you how it's different. I came to church, as Ken said, in 1979, where I'm serving now. And when an engaged couple would come for premarital counseling, they would be very reticent to volunteer their live-in arrangement. 
Their parents had already likely weighed in and registered their disapproval. Whatever you do, don't tell your grandparents about it. They would have expected some reaction from me because most of the cultural institutions of which they were a part would have raised question with it. Now fast forward to 2013. And, and imagine couples coming to me, as they do, who are engaged to be married. They are relatively nonchalant about living together. They mention the huge savings financially it is for them to pull their resources. And they tell me that, and this seems to make sense, that, uh, that living together is sort of like a trial run for marriage. Their parents have already expressed uh, positive regard for it. They're, maybe even their grandparents, too. And they would be surprised, many of them, if, if I would raise question with it, because all the cultural institutions are weighing in positively now in this regard. Now, there are a lot of people my age and life stage who want to go back to the good old days, maybe all the way back to the 1950s or early 60s, and there's no going back. And we cannot put the genie back in the bottle. And actually, I think we've got to go farther back. And I am intrigued with the synergy between the 21st century in which we live and the first century. Isn't this interesting in terms of polytheism? and pluralism, and Gnosticism, which, which some have said is the most enduring heresy, this bifurcation of body and soul, that the, the body is relatively immaterial. What you do with it doesn't matter. And it's the soul that really matters. Even the church talks about saving souls. Now, I am a practitioner. I, I'm not a scholar. But I think, like you, I invest enormous amounts of energy trying to make sense of the sweeping changes of our world and what they mean for the church. The Pharisees and Sadducees come to Jesus, and they ask him to show them a sign. And in the text, it says they come to test Jesus. Circle the word test. And, and then uh, Jesus says these words to them. When evening comes, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. In the morning, today it will be stormy. For the sky is red and overcast. Some of you will recall an adage uh, by sailors. That red sky at night, sailors delight, red sky in morning, sailors warning. And, and then Jesus goes on, and here's the bite. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. And then Jesus says, rather cryptically, the only sign you're going to get will be the sign of Jonah, which when we go back means uh, someone being in the belly of a great fish for three days. And with that, he turns and walks away. I, I love it how Jesus reduces his critics to silence so many times. And my point is, could Jesus be asking or even saying this, you know, how to interpret the signs of the weather, as if we even know that. But you do not know how to interpret the sign of the times. I, my, great, my great concern for the church today is that we're not able to discern the sign of the times. I attended a conference a couple years ago. It was a conference for calling together leaders in the new, this is a New Global South Church uh, from Asia and Africa and Latin America. 
And, and in that conference, they ask uh, those of us serving churches in the West a question. And, and the question is, will the church in the West exert a prophetic voice or will we merely mimic culture and entertain our members? They ask, ask that not with a spirit of triumphalism, but with all humility. And it's a question that still burns in me. And I am concerned that we're losing this ability to discern a cultural from biblical value. And are we not like the people of Nineveh, virtually, who cannot tell one's right from left? Now, you may be thinking, well, someone my age would think the signs are altogether ominous. We're in a free fall, and we're hurtling toward the end times. Actually, I'm not so sure. There are enormous headwinds against the church. There are also tailwinds, and they're underappreciated, and they're underrecognized. And, and sometimes I can't tell, are we in, in the West, the church in the West, are we in sunrise or sunset? But my reading of church history is that every 500 years, God undergoes something of a spring cleaning. The last one was called the Reformation. So I see two hopeful signs. And I think for those of you who are preparing for gospel ministry, I think it bodes well. One has to do with authenticity, and the other has to do with spirituality. And I think they're uh, very similar to each other. First, authenticity. My read of newer generations is that authenticity is a must. That, that among newer generations, there's this uncanny ability to discriminate real from fake, phony people. Uh, the antennas in newer generations are really up here. And, and they have this great capacity. And, and even though the phrase, keep it real, is a little shopworn by now, it does express uh, sort of the sign of the time. And what I'm seeing in the church is that newer generations are not looking for slick worship. They're certainly not interested in petty church politic. But they are interested in genuine communities of faith. And, and so I don't know, I don't understand this this predilection of the evangelical church to rush out and baptize the next program, the next book, the next gimmick. Because I think what people are really looking for, especially in newer generations, are authentic, genuine communities of faith. The, the second hopeful sign I see has to do with spirituality. The people today I, I see are looking for a transcendent meaning to life. And I think Tim Keller here is spot on. He, he talks about, in one of his writings, about how the culture is becoming more secular and more spiritual simultaneously. That both are claiming adherence and both are claiming virt uh, victory. Now, uh, maybe you've seen some of the polls about uh, the fastest growing religious preference. No religious preference. Nuns. A and atheism uh, of late ha has a certain cool factor in American society. But, but here's the other side. That I'm finding people are running secularity all the way down and are finding it wanting. And they're showing up in our churches. And the, 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 uh, the vacuous expression 
that I'm, I'm lo looking for meaning to my life beyond myself. I'm looking for a transcendent meaning to my life. Now, the challenge, I think, that comes with the church is there's no external referent to this. And so I find that people are, they're sort of involved in a, a sort of quasi-New Age, do-it-yourself, Oprah, spirituality. And, and maybe you've heard the sort of code word for this. I'm, I'm not religious. I'm spiritual hear that all the time. Here's the irony. The irony is they are receptive to spirituality and they don't expect to find that spirituality in the church. They do not expect the church to be an inculcator of vital spirituality. Pox on our house. It's our own fault, really. We fuss so much, and I see this in the church. We fuss so much about the color of the carpet and about perceived slights in relationship with each other. That, that the church is so about institutional maintenance of the ABCs, you know, the attendance, buildings, and cash. And we do not uh, attend to people's spiritual longings. Willow Creek. Uh, for a long time has been sort of lifted up as the uh, seeker-sensitive church. And they conducted a few years ago, 2006 or 7, a survey called Reveal Survey, in which they uh, looked at what are the indicators for vital spiritual growth. And, and let me uh, summarize their findings to you. Spiritual maturity is not dependent on elaborate church programming. It is dependent on prayer, scripture reading, spiritual friends. Fancy that. The year I came to D.C. was the year... Pope John Paul was going to his homeland, Poland. He had recently been uh, named the Pope and had uh, wanted to take the papacy to his homeland. Now, in, in 1979, uh, Poland was a police state. It was uh, officially a communist state, an atheistic state. So the uh, government was in something of a bind. They wanted to promote atheism, and yet it would be embarrassing to them not to allow Pope John Paul to come to his homeland. So they allowed him to come. And, and during that time, they sent uh, missives to the schools in particular to, uh, even though the Pope is coming, we want to affirm that we are an atheistic state, and you are to instruct your students accordingly. So Pope John Paul arrives in Warsaw, and his motorcade takes him to Victory Square. And one million people are waiting to be receiving the Lord's Supper. And, and so this, this uh, Victory Square is just filled with people, and, and the communists are sort of hanging out the windows watching to see what will happen. And, and, and Pope John Paul says, you know, it's sort of incongruous that, that a Pole, a Polish man, would be a cult of the papacy. What does this mean for me? And what does it mean for, for us as a Polish Christian? And uh, somewhere in the crowd, a chant began to rise. We want God. We want God. And it became thunderous in a million people shouting this. And the communists are watching this. And there's nothing they can do to silence it. 
there wouldn't be enough prisons to do so. And we want God is what burns under our fingernails and burns in our hearts. And I am optimistic because of this cry of the human heart. People, my friends, want God. And so we must bring God to them. Let us pray. Holy God, loving God, we pray that we would be people who are able to discern the sign of the times. Help us to understand these biblical and cultural values. As people predominantly in the West and around the world, and we pray for your church, rise up your church with broken wing and uh, fill it with your Holy Spirit presence. Lord, for those who are in the work of teaching here, we're praying for professors and leaders of this seminary. For those whose students, O oh Lord, are being called into places of ministry and witness, we, we pray for such people. And we pray in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen.